Well, so now we will be learning about Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Uh, so Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations basically deals with like how you have this embassy offices, consuls, and how, uh, you know, diplomatic relations is advanced in the international perspective and so on. So we will not go through the entire, um, you know, the, uh, the, the entire um, convention itself, but we will discuss only important provisions. However, you are at the liberty to check the Vienna Convention as a whole. It's there in a textbook and also it's available online. Well, Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, the two conventions on diplomatic international relations, which is a cornerstone of international diplomacy are one, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961 and the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963. Now, this convention, the first convention, Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961, it contains nearly 53 articles. So in all, it has got 53 articles and 193 state parties have ratified or rather have agreed. They have they are signatories to this Vienna Convention. They have ratified it. They have agreed to follow uh, Vienna Convention and including all the UN member states with the exception of uh, South Sudan and Palau and the UN observer states of the Holy See and State of Palestine. Next, this is an international treaty that outlines the diplomatic relations between independent countries, which aims at building and nurturing friendly relations among governments through the established uniform set of practices and principles. Now, Vienna Convention, it has codified the system of diplomatic immunity to the extent that diplomats are granted the privilege to render their service freely, to articulate their dialogue freely and negotiate freely. So this was a contribution of Vienna Convention to the diplomat community in terms of the immunity and the privileges it has provided to the diplomats, to the international diplomats, and to the extent that they are granted the privilege to, you know, render their service freely, represent their, con their country freely, articulate dialogue freely, and negotiate. Some of the important provisions that I've picked up is Article 2 that talks about mutual consent, which simply states that diplomatic relations are of mutual consent. That is, it is mutual. The state parties have agreed it. So, Together, so they are of mutual uh, consent when it comes to diplomatic relations. Diplomatic relations are of mutual consent. Next is Article 3, diplomatic mission. Diplomatic mission countries have got the right to set up appropriate communication system, listen to me carefully, or contact points for their people who are scattered in other countries. And thus, this article permits the setting up of diplomatic missions in the form of embassies in other nations. Now, how? This is by virtue of Article 3 of the Vienna Conventions. It is the Article 3 of Vienna Convention that has, you know, enumerated the setting up of embassies in other countries or councils in other countries. Last class, we learned about what is the difference between embassy and consul and so on. So the term embassy here, when we're talking about Article 3 and as a whole, when we're referring to embassy, so that means it implies the office as well as the embassy staff. So it just doesn't mean building there. Embassy is just not only the building or a particular office who is the head of the particular office. It's just not that. It's just not a particular ambassador there. But embassy implies, when you're referring to an embassy, it implies not just the office, but also the entire staff members of the particular embassy. So embassies and diplomatic missions are inviolable. That means they their rights cannot be trespassed. Their premises cannot be trespassed. It cannot be violated. Their premises cannot be violated or even accessed by even the host country without the appropriate permission of relevant authorities. I am repeating this. This is very important that you understand this. Embassies and diplomatic missions are inviolable. That means they it can they they cannot be violated. Their premises cannot be violated. I'm sure if you go to any embassy, they'll just not allow anyone to like any Tom, Dick, and Harry just to enter the premises. 
Are you understanding? So if we go there, we'll have to provide our identity. We'll have to provide our ID cards. We'll have to tell the purpose of our meeting. And in case there is an appointment, they will check the appointment. I and mean, it's a procedure. So therefore, embassies and diplomatic missions are inviolable. It's just not only for the general public, but also when it comes to the host country, certain important people from the host country, the premises cannot be trespassed or even accessed by the host country without the appropriate permission of relevant authorities. So there has to be appropriate permission of relevant authorities here. Next is Article 5 deals with the head of mission. The head of mission certainly acts as a representative of the sending state. That is the state, you know, on whose behalf they have established the embassy in some other state or in some other country. Now, Article 9 talks about the right of the host state to reject a diplomatic mission. So the host nation may at, at any time for any reasonable cause, they reserve the right to reject a diplomatic mission of a sending state and declare a diplomat as a persona non grata. This is very, very important. So they may declare a diplomat as a persona non grata, which literally means an unwelcomed person. Persona non grata simply means an unwelcomed person. So this is a legal mechanism that permits countries to bar diplomatic missions or diplomats of any country. Now, such a diplomat may not be protected under the term of immunity and privileges after being declared as a persona non grata. Now, suppose a country says, no, this diplomatic mission or any person is considered as a persona non grata. That means, obviously, whatever immunity and privileges they have, it would be withdrawn for them. That means if the immunity and privileges is withdrawn, like one of the immunity is right not to be arrested. You understand me? Right not to present themselves in the court of law unless it is required to be done or it is under the command of the, you know, the sending country. But normally, the host nation cannot compel them to you know, participate in, in any judicial proceedings or be a witness at any judicial proceedings. They cannot be uh, arrested and so on. So these are some of the immunity and privileges that are granted to the diplomats. So in case any country says, uh, say, well, we are you know, rejecting a particular diplomatic mission and, they're saying, let, uh, and they declare a particular person as a persona non grata, which simply means they're an unwelcome person. We're not interested in hosting you. Then what happens? That means all the immunity and privileges are, uh, you know, are suspended. They're inoperative. The rule is inoperative. So thereby, what would happen? That means they are bare, and it could happen that they can be harmed or they could be arrested. So thereby, upon such notification of such a declaration, the sending state has to immediately withdraw and recall the mission in the best interest of the diplomat and the sending nation, of course. And they have to withdraw the mission or a particular diplomat who is still within the territory of the host country within a specified period, within a specified reasonable time. Well, then Article 14 deals with diplomatic accreditation, which simply means um, it is a form of a mechanism of certifying diplomatic heads. Next is Article 22 and Article 30. It deals with search and trespass of diplomat premises. There should be no search and trespass of diplomat premises, including the private residence of the diplomat without a valid order. Now, this one includes within its ambit uh, under Article 30, even the private residence of a diplomat without a valid order. So the premises of a diplomatic mission, the property of a diplomatic mission are considered inviolable property or inviolable premises, and thereby the host country cannot trespass or conduct a research off the premises or seize the house or the property or the premises or the documents of the diplomat without reasonable cause. Now, this privilege is extended even to the private resident of the diplomats under Article 30 of the convention. Which convention? Vienna Convention. Vienna Convention, very important question when it comes to exams. Vienna Convention, this question is very, very important. I mean, you should be expecting this question for your exams. Next is Article 24 and 27, and these are important articles. All these articles has to be present in your answers. 
Well, Article 24 and Article 27, correspondence and communication protected. So the archives and the document of diplomatic mission are inviolable and shall not be seized for, or even opened by a host government. That means in case they receive any parcels, they receive any courier, they receive any, um, any kind of communication, like from, say, even the sending country or anywhere. So these bags, consul bags or briefcases of diplomats, it cannot be seized. It cannot be searched by any government authority of the host country or any courier. It could be post. It could be even if they have grounds of valid suspicion. No, even any messenger of the diplomat should be arrested or detained or any parcel of the diplomat should be detained. So such an arrest or detention would be considered as illegal and wrong in international law and a contravention of Article 27 of the Vienna Convention. That means that means it would be against Article 27 of Vienna Convention in case I do that. Thereby free communication from the host country is permitted. Next is Article 29, diplomatic immunity and privilege of freedom from arrest and detention while in office. The receiving state must endeavor to protect the person and dignity of a diplomat and the diplomat enjoys the privilege of freedom from arrest and detention. Article 31 and 32 talks about civil and criminal immunity where these diplomats are granted the privilege of uh, you know, not being subjected to the jurisdiction of the host state where you know, they are not required to go to any, not uh, you know, required to answer the summons of any of the courts of the host country. However, unless any act is done by them in a personal capacity and it is not within the purview of the diplomatic office of function, so a diplomatic agent here is not obligated to give evidence as a witness. However, as per Article 32, the sending state may waive or suspend this immunity. Now, the question is whether this immunity exists. Normally, it exists unless there is a specific waiver or a document which waives this kind of immunity for a particular diplomat who is stationed in some other country. Next is Article 36 and 37, exemption from taxes and custom duties. Diplomatic missions are exempt from taxes and custom duties. They are not just like normal business or normal profession or normal, you know, and afraid they are diplomatic missions. They are representatives of the government. They are representing their government in some other country. So they are exempt from taxes. The officers are exempt from taxes and customs duties. Article 37 talks about shared privileges between diplomats and their family members. Family members of diplomats who are living in the host country are also bestowed with most of the protections equally granted to the diplomats. So this ensures that the family members are not subject to any kind of coercion that is or any force or duress as well. They're not subject to it, you know, reveal something or talk about something. They cannot be arrested or they cannot be um, interrogated or forced to talk something, example of coercion or duress as well. So, you know, they cannot be forced to do something. The privileges that are granted to the diplomat is also granted to the family members of the diplomat so they are not under any threat or they cannot be forced to do something now article 42 diplomat shall not engage in trade or commerce for personal benefit now the, a diplomatic agent in the receiving state shall not practice for personal profit any profession or commercial activity he shall not engage in any trade or commerce because he is a diplomat and he is on a, on a government agenda. He is a government official. He is not expected to participate in any business or engage in any trade or commerce for personal benefit. Next is Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963. So that is it with Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961. Next, now we are going to learn about Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963. Now this convention specifically deals with the consular relation, relations of embassies and so on. This was adopted in 1963, but it came into force in 1967. This is ratified by 182 countries and it contains 79 articles. 79 articles, 79 articles. So this is an international treaty that outlines consular relations between sovereign states and has codified 
That means what is codification? That is, it is divided into sections or articles. It has codified consular practices that have their origin in state customs, that is customs of nations. So it has its actual origin in the customs and usages, customs and usages of different countries and several bilateral agreements between states or nations. Now, this convention defines the functions, rights, and immunities that are conferred upon consular officers and their officers, as well as the rights and duties of receiving state and sending state. Now, what's a receiving state? What do we mean by receiving state? Even earlier, I mentioned the word receiving state. And then I also spoke about sending state. Receiving state is nothing but a state or a country where the consul is established and a sending state is a state that the consul represents. For example, example, um, there is a uh, you know, Somalian embassy in some other country or there is UAE embassy in England. There is UK embassy in UAE. There is US embassy in some other country, in India. There is Indian embassy in USA. There is Indian embassy in UAE, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, wherever. So you have different embassies established in other parts of the world, other parts of the nation, in the best interest of their own people, in the best interest of the nation, and also in the best interest of, you know, developing or advancing relationship with the world with the country in which they have established their embassy or consul or consulate. And I told you the difference between consulate and embassy as well, last class. Now, well, some important provisions of this convention is of course a preamble. The preamble is a striking feature of this treaty and the striking feature of the preamble is that it enunciates that customary international law shall apply to matters that are not addressed in the convention so matters that are not available in the convention so it can be uh you know um uh, addressed by customary international law article 5 talks about the functions of the council that is, this particular article enumerates the functions of the council and additionally exemplifies the goal of advancing commercial, economic, cultural, and scientific relations between the sending state and the receiving state. Now, persona non grata. What is this? We came across this term earlier, that is, just some time back when we were discussing the, uh, you know, the earlier convention, persona non grata. Persona non grata, again, I'm repeating, persona non grata means, simply means, you know, a person is unwelcomed. It literally means an unwelcome person. So the host nation may at any time for any reasonable cause reserve the right to reject a diplomatic mission of a sending state and declare a particular consul as persona non grata, which literally means an unwelcome person. So this is a legal mechanism that permits countries to bar diplomatic missions or consuls of any country. And such a consul member may not be protected under the term of immunity. Why? Because he is an unwelcome person. They have declared him as a persona non grata. So naturally, immunity and privileges which you know were there granted to him earlier is now suspended that means he may be arrested he may be called to you know present himself in the court so to avoid such unpalatable situations the you know sending state has to immediately withdraw or recall the mission or even this diplomat from that particular country and call him back to their own country as fast as possible that is within the territory so i mean from where from the territory of the host country so if he's still there in the territory of the host country they should within a reasonable period immediately recall the mission or withdraw him from that particular territory and bring him back to his country next is article 31 consular premises inviolable it is, I mean, the premises cannot be violated. It is inviolable. Premises cannot be violated. They cannot trespass. Next is Article 35 and 36, freedom of communication. The right to communication and free correspondence is protected. Consular bags, posts, and couriers shall not be detained. This is the same as uh, you know, the earlier convention that we studied about, we learned about, you know, where their bags, their posts, their couriers, 
you know, courier parcels cannot be detained. Next is Article 36 specifies about foreign nationals. Now, these foreign nationals who are arrested or detained should be given notice without delay of their right to have their embassy or consulate notified of that arrest. And consular officers shall have the right to visit a national of the sending state who is in prison, custody or detention to converse and correspond with him and to arrange for his legal representation, that is arrange for lawyers to represent him in his case. 37 speaks about death of a state national or a vessel wreck or a shipwreck. The host country must, without delay, notify consular officers of the sending state in the case of death of sending states national. In case of a death of a sending states national, then the host country must immediately notify consular officers of you know, the sending state, the death of the sending state national. For the consular officers must also be informed without delay in case of a shipwreck or even sending states vessel is wrecked in the territorial sea or international or internal waters of receiving state or if an aircraft that is registered in the sending state suffers an accident on the territory of the receiving state in case there's an aircraft uh, air crash sorry there's a aircraft which has crashed within the uh, the territory of the sending uh, of the hosting uh, uh, state then it has to immediately intimate to the sending state that there has been an accident within our territory. Next is Article 40 talks about the dignity, dignity of consular officers or dignitary, dignity of the dignitaries, dignity of the consular officers, dignity of consular dignitaries. So the receiving state shall treat consular officers or consular dignitaries with due respect and shall take all appropriate step to prevent any attack on their person, freedom or dignity. So this is it. And uh, about this is about Vienna Convention. And Vienna Convention, there are two conventions that are important. That is Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961. And the provisions that I, uh, you know, discussed today are important provisions. A question will come on Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. For that, you will have to write that the two conventions on diplomatic international relations, which is a cornerstone of international diplomacy, are the uh, uh, is the Vienna Convention on Diplomat Diplomatic Relations, under which we have the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, 1961, and the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, 1963. You'll have to write both these conventions as part of this bracketed Vienna Convention. Understand, even if I ask you Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, I want you to write down even about the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, because these are two conventions that are the cornerstone of international diplomacy. A question can come for your exams. Explain the conventions that are the cornerstone of international diplomacy. Now we are going to discuss about your question paper pattern. Before that, do you have any questions today? If not, then okay, we will proceed further and we'll discuss about the question paper pattern. Uh, In case we get disconnected, just join back because I want another video for this. Just join back, please. We are going to discuss on the question paper pattern. And this question is very important for your exams. That is the Vienna Convention. I'm reiterating that. Just join back, please. 